and uh, welcome to this video lecture on geodata modeling. This is a overview video where I will be talking about the general concepts. I will try and give span out what we will be covering in the following videos. So this one is just to give you an idea and to be able to place the more detailed videos into context as we go along. So think of this as the first video in a long series of video lectures and hopefully this will give you a good start on the course. So first of all let's talk about what is geospatial data modeling. Well, if we look at the first word um, we will talk about geospatial or geotemporal and whatever it would indicate that our data set has geographic coordinates or references to locations in it. And if we talk about geotemporal, we indicate that our data not only references to location, but also references to time. If we look at the concept of data, let's just think of it as now as data being a symbolic representation of information. And finally, if we look at the word modeling, modeling is probably the world's most misused word. And here I will use not less than four different types of modeling. First of all, we'll talk about conceptual modeling or ontologies, where we define what we see. So if we have a reality, we will have to define an ontology or a conceptual model through which we can decide which aspects of the real world, the reality that we see. So for instance, do we see um, trees and not roads? That is all part of this conceptual model. Then we'll talk about digital representation models. So how our geotemporal or geospatial data is represented in digital form on the computer. We'll talk about analysis models. So how can we analyze how many green areas are within the boundary of a municipality or how far is that from an airport to the nearest uh, dwelling areas. And finally, but not least, we'll talk about visualization models. So how cartographical models. So how can we visualize our digital representation. So if we go into a bit more detail and start out by looking at what is data, um, we can return to this concept or that data is a symbolic representation. So that's really important because what the hang of that is or the snag of it is that we it's important that we can read the same information from the symbols as was placed in the symbols when they were written. So does those does the data do we read the data or the symbols of the data as as they are intended to be read? And that is always one of these key issues when working with data. Do is there a a correlation or is it the same that we read and we, someone else has write, written down into the data. Um, these terms data and knowledge they come from this concept of the knowledge triangle and believers of, of this knowledge triangle they have a tendency to say that from data comes information and from information comes knowledge. Um, a word of warning here, there is such a thing as misinformation or alternative facts. Um, and of course, if you have alternative facts, you will get alternative information and an alternative knowledge. And no one wants to have alternative knowledge. So be aware that, of course, someone has put the data into digital form and not only do you have to 
read the data as it was intended, but you also have to be aware that the intention of the person delivering the data might not be in alignment with your intention of using it. So be aware that not, especially when you work with public information databases, that there might be a tendency for the data not to be completely wrong, but maybe misleading in some form. Finally, if we look at, uh, not finally, if we look at how da data represents information, we typically take the form of this where we say that we have an entity, and an entity is a thing in our world of discourse, our, the way that we see reality. And these things, they have properties. So a building can have a height and so on. And these properties will have a value. So the height of the building is 10 meters. So for instance, we could say that if we look at the property, the highest completed education of a person, then that might be a master's program. Or to another one, that the gender of person one it has the value of female. So the red ones are the properties, the pink and murky ones are the entities, and these light blue ones are the values of the properties. Um, one special thing when we talk about geospatial data is that we work with what we call um, phenomena or um, property fields. So for instance, elevation, temperature, things that vary continuous through space. What we do when we represent these is that we represent the state of this property or property field at a specific location. So we could say that the elevation at location one is 35 meters above sea level. Okay. So this is a special twist when we have these property fields. So these things that vary continuous through space. Um, the digital representation of data is also very important to understand some of the basic concepts. So depending on how we, uh, we look at it, the, the common way to do it is in a tabular form, which in computer lingo is called a representational model, so a relational model. And um, in this relational model, or in these tables, if you wish, each of our rows is a in, represents an entity, okay, or as it's called in the computer lingo, each tuple represents an entity. Um, the word tuple is the importance of that is that we can't be sure that the rows are ordered. So therefore, in computer lingo, we talk about tuples to just avoid this little misunderstanding that they will be in a specific order. So we talk about that each tuple represents a entity. And each of our columns that we again in computer lingo will call attributes, they represent a property of our entity. So again, if we look at the same data as we looked at before, we have that our person one, she is a female, and the highest completed education for person one is a master program. So this is and this is by far the most common way of representing data when we talk about geospatial data. Um, next, we'll have to look a bit at what these special things in this geospatial and geotemporal. So first of all, let's look at what time and what makes time different. First of all, uh, a key element of time is that entity properties can change over time. Their values can change over time, if you to be more precise. So for instance, that um, the population of, in this case, we have different um, regions in Denmark, that population will change over time. Um, another interesting property of time is that we can look at it both as continuous so as we had in this first example, 
where we had a timeline, or we can look at them as discrete. So look at what was the value in year one, the year two, and year three. So, and these years are then completely discrete element. So time can both be seen as continuous and as discrete. If we look at what makes spatial data different, depending on, uh, on how we, we look at it, we can talk about um, spatial data as categorical, so representing, in this case, municipalities and, um, and the, um, the percentage of, in each municipality, the percentage of the population that has a master's degree as the highest completed education. So in this case, we are talking about discrete categorical objects, municipalities, and we're talking, looking at them as in, in a spatial view. We can also look at data as categorical in a non-spatial display. So here we have, again, our data from population and education, but here just as a graph. So we are not using the spatial aspect, but it's still it's the, the, the unit, our categorical unit is again our spatial unit. We can also look at um, space as continuous. So a, as we walk over the surface or fly over the surface of the earth, it is one continuous surface. So we can look at variations in the mean temperature as a continuous function of location. We can also look at spatial data as networks that we can navigate through, so we can follow the road, turn right, turn left, and so on. So we have these um, three important ways of looking at um, as spatial data as categorical, so entities, municipalities, as continuous, so we looked at the mean temperature, or as networks. Another interesting thing with spatial data is that it has its own operators. Um, we can talk about distance between two locations, overlapping of soil and pollutants, so intersections, and we can also talk about which municipality neighbors another municipality. So there's lots of operators that are special for the spatial domain. Um, and finally, if we look at visualization, there is one really special thing about visualizing spatial data, is that it always will take up our x and y dimension of our visualization. And that's something of a problem because x and y are the two most important components of a visualization so we have used them for our spatial element and that means we can't use them for displaying how much or categories or something like this we see in this example where we're using our y dimension for the different categories and our x dimension for the different values so, so always when visualizing data consider hmm, do I need the spatial element? Because if you need your, your spatial element in your visualization, you are taking up one of those most powerful aspects of a visualization, namely the location in the XY dimension. So these are some of the big things that make this special. If you look at how we can represent it, we could say that there are two or three different classical representation forms. We can talk about vector representation, which you might know as from a drawing program, where we can draw points, lines, and polygons, or to be more precise, areas, because there can be holes in them and different things. Um, so this is, we make a piece of geometry, a polygon in this case, and we say this polygon represents a municipality, or that represents the spatial aspect of the municipality, the spatial property of the municipality. Draw a line that will represent the spatial property of a road. Or we will draw a point 
and that will then represent um, the spatial property of a tree. We can work about raster data. Raster data works in small squares where um, each square then has assigned a value to it so that we can say, okay, at this location, in this little square, we have a forest or a lake or a town or whatever. So these are especially good when we talk about representing um, continuous surfaces, so these property fields. Um, a last type of data that is of importance is that we really can work with non-spatial data. So, and the trick is here that if we have a, some spatial data, for instance, a polygon saying this is the spatial aspect of the municipality of Copenhagen, and we have some information that says this is a population in, in the Copenhagen municipality, these two information parts can be joined together. So in that way, we can work with what otherwise would be conceived as a non-spatial data in a spatial manner. So to sum this up in a bit of an overview, we can look at the process in general and talk about what is geographic or geospatial modeling. We will start out by having our reality. Onto that reality, we look on that reality through our ontology, or uh, we might call them this conceptual model, where we define what we can see, bits of the elements of the reality, will go into our world of discourse, the things we can see, and how can we talk about them, so which properties do we have. All of this is what we called our conceptual model. Based on the conceptual model, we can make a digital representation. Digital representation itself is seldom a goal, but it is a, uh, a mean for something. So and typically the mean would be to do analysis. So we will have um, different analysis models. So we can uh, do all of these overlays on neighborhood or distance or all of these different types of analysis that we'll be talking about throughout this series of video lectures or this course. And we can also do visualization models, so how we wish to visualize our data in different more or less fancy method ways to bring out that information to the reader of our product. So basically we are talking about cartographic communication, how we communicate that information that originally was represented in our reality, was transformed to a digital representation, and finally that we will visualize it in a way that our audience can understand the information we wish to convey. So I hope you like this short little overview, and as I said, that there will be many more videos that looks at the different steps in much more detail, and we'll also be looking not only as talking theoretically about it, but we'll also go into how we can do this in both QGIS and in ArcGIS Pro. So we'll be using those two pieces of, of GIS software, and we'll also be using Tableau for doing these more, more advanced non-spatial visualizations. So the three pieces of software that will be accompanying this video series is QGIS, an open source GIS you can download free, ArcGIS Pro, which is a commercial GIS, and Tableau, which you can have R as a free version, or you can have it as a commercial version. They can do more or less the same, but you can't um, store your data locally in the open source, so you can't hide your data from other people. It has to be public data to use the open source version of Tableau. So I hope you liked it. See you in the other videos. Bye.